What is your net worth? I'm sure your answer to this question has probably changed in the last three years since 2007. Many of us have felt the effects of the recession upon us, and that number has changed for not only private individuals, but for corporations across the board. Their net worth has plummeted. Many of us have experienced the after effects of this recession as well. In terms of unemployment, even personally, in our congregation we've experienced this. But the homeless, the jobless rate continues to rise while our home values continue to plummet. I would imagine our net worths have dropped. Although I tried to see the silver lining in this dark cloud and That is, that Jesus did say in Matthew 19, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Although I don't find much solace in that. Now, as I was considering this, the other evening, I came across on my bank's website a net worth calculator. A net worth calculator that figures out how you stack up with your debts and your assets. You plug in the different numbers, the various debts you have, the various assets you have, and it shows you a beautiful number. Well, I gotta be honest, it didn't share any new truths with me. Seminary and college are expensive. However, one of the things that came to mind as I was putting the information into this net worth calculator is how we could easily, how I could easily change it to say more perfect things. For instance, if I put in there that I, my house was worth $300,000 and I had two cars that were worth $50,000, well then, it'd make my net worth go way up. But that wouldn't be accurate, now would it? And if I were to eliminate all my debt, well then it would make my net worth go way up. But when we don't put in those accurate numbers, we don't get accurate results. And I thought about how this also applies spiritually. And I thought to myself, well, how handy would it be to have a net worth calculator for our spiritual lives? We plug into the net worth calculator our debts, our our sinfulness, and in the other side we plug in our good works, the times we've shared the gospel, the times we've gone to church, the times we've read the word, and we find out, we hit the total button and see what it says. How handy would that be? How nice would it be to just be able to click that in and see, well, this is how many more good works I need to do until I am saved. Well, as I hear a couple of you chuckling, you know that's not how it works. We can't stockpile good works. In fact, as we start to figure out our net worth with the, if we were to figure out our net worth with a net worth spiritual calculator, we'd find that it would constantly be running in the negatives. We'd find that that net worth calculator would never balance out. The longer we live, in fact, the greater the margin grows between our good works and our sinful lives. The longer we live, the more sinful we grow. Not that we start to sin more, just that our sins accumulate. And as we start to figure out our net worth, our spiritual net worth, in fact, it comes back as worthless. Worthless is kind of a hard word to swallow, isn't it? Kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth as you roll it over with your tongue. It's what makes Christ's sacrifice for us so much more important. Because Christ didn't see us ever as worthless. Christ didn't ever see us as nobodies, but always saw us as children. He didn't give his life, he didn't give gold or silver. He gave his precious life because we were worth it. He gave his all because we were worth it. When Christ died on the cross, he made us go from worthless to inestimable worth. Worth that we could not compare. And amazingly, amazingly, he continues to bless us beyond that. Amazingly, he continues to bless us beyond that gift of eternal life which he has so richly given to us. Worth beyond we can imagine. Eternal life is a promise greater than we could even ask for. And not only does he give us that, but he gives us more than that. He continues to bless us each and every day. Every day that we see the sun, 
blessing. Every day that we have air to breathe is a blessing. The warm or cool homes that you woke up in this morning, it's a blessing. The warm meals we'll eat in just a little while, it's a blessing. The ability we have to share these blessings is even a blessing. And these gifts we have are meant to be shared. The gifts that God has given us, He intends for us to give to others. Now that we are redeemed children, the greatest gift of all has been given to us, and He intends for us to share that gift. Now in the Old Testament, as many of you know, or maybe you don't know, but God demanded a certain percentage of the gifts. It was called the tithe. And in several places in the Old Testament, He demanded a tenth of all of the Israelites' earnings. It wasn't the net worth, but it was their gross income. It was off the top. Before you figured out anything else, God demanded a tenth. And as we look at that 10%, well, it doesn't seem too bad, does it? 90% is for us to keep. 10% is, goes to God. When we look at a dollar, that works out to a dime, goes to God. When we look at $100, 10 bucks goes to God. When we look at $1,000, $100 goes to God. But as we start to look at those numbers climb, it doesn't become as easy when we start to look at that gross income. The higher the gross income, the harder it is to give that 10%. Now God had demanded this 10% to take care of three, group, three main groups of people. Certainly it was beyond that, but first and foremost, the widows and the orphans. Second, the Gentiles, believe it or not. And third, the priests. God intended those gifts, that 10%, to be used in that way. Now, I'm sure some of you are probably quite happy that God has not made the same demand in the New Testament. God has not made the demand of 10% in the New Testament. Christ has fulfilled the law. Especially when you consider that God, that the people were cursed who did not tithe. Malachi chapter 3, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Those who are not tithing were robbing God. Not a good thing. But I think oftentimes when we start to look at tithing, we look at that 10% command in the Old Testament, we start to think about money. And how can we not? Isn't money what tithing is about? 